Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In chapters 14 and 15 of Seneca's On the Shortness of Life, we have this wonderful discussion about how studying philosophy in a certain way not only you know, helps us out as human beings and makes us wiser, but actually amounts to a great use of our time and gives us more time than we would normally have. You could think of it as a time multiplier as one of the things that you ought to invest in to get a great return. Not exactly the metaphor that Seneca uses here, but one that makes sense given the rest of what he says in the work. And it begins with this observation, and it's translated typically, only those who give their time to philosophy. And strictly speaking, it's to wisdom, sapientiae, and vacant. Now, this vacare can mean to devote time to, to you know, be at, at ease, be at leisure, be idle, and occupy your leisure time with something. So giving your time to wisdom, the time that you actually have available, what does that do for us? He tells us, they alone who do this are at leisure. They have otium, right? They alone really live. And this is going to go beyond the typical, you know, if you're studying philosophy, you're going to have a richer life, a more prudent life, a rational life. That's all true, right? So in, in the sense that we're interested in time, he says not only do they watch over their own time well, bene, literally their lifetime or their age, their ivum, right? So, you know, philosophy is good for that. And we can see why if we've st studied any philosophy, we're not going to make as many stupid decisions. <laughs> we're not going to fritter away our time with valueless pursuits, you know, spending it on things that we think matter at the time. And then when later on, we realize don't. That's all true. But... What Seneca is saying here goes beyond this. We get into the realm of the philosophy of time or uh, a branch of metaphysics in this. And he says that what they do is they annex, they add literally every other age, every other ivum to their own by studying philosophy. It's not only their own lifetime, right? And he says, unless we prove most ungrateful, these most distinguished founders of hallowed thoughts came into being for us. Now, that's an interesting thought, too, isn't it? Socrates, you know, in the present, we would say, well, he didn't know who we were going to be. But he left behind a legacy, as did so many other philosophers, according to Seneca. That is our inheritance. It's for us if we choose uh, for it to be that. He says, for us, they prepared a way of living, not just a way of thinking, but a way of living. And if we jump ahead to the very end where he's, you know, summing things up for his friend, he says, um, those with an active interest should progress to better things. What is that? Love and practice of the virtues, forgetfulness of the passions, knowledge of how to live and die, and deep repose. So, you know, philosophy as a way of life actually opens the door for us to have much more life by taking on that of others. He says, we're led by the work of these others into the presence of the most beautiful treasures which have been pulled from darkness and brought to light. 
Now, what kind of darkness are we talking about? The darkness of forgetfulness. Every single generation has to reread the books, read the books themselves for the first time, decide what they're actually going to spend their time on. Otherwise, things are way back in the dark, dusky, you know, probably uh, hard to access storehouse. But then we bring them out by, say, reading Seneca, and we've got access to it. And you don't have to pay a lot for this, right? Except in terms of your time. And so Seneca says this incredibly optimistic thing. We have this vast span of time that we can range over. He says, from no age are we debarred. We have access to all. And if we want to transcend the narrow limitations of human weakness by our expansiveness of mind, there is this great span of time for us to range over. And if you think about the people that he's talking about, you know, centuries have passed since many of these philosophers came on the scene. And, you know, he is as distant from, you know, say, Democritus as I, I suppose you could say we are from, you know, Rene Descartes or even uh, earlier thinkers, right? So this is worth keeping in mind. There is this vast span of time already there that we can range over. And then he's going to name a number of different representative philosophers. And, you know, in, in a certain way, we're fortunate in that we have hundreds and hundreds more, including this guy Seneca himself. So he'll tell us in this very famous passage, we can debate with Socrates, something that Socrates himself is known for, right? Entertain doubt with Carneades. Carneades is one of the academic skeptics, and doubt for him is a very important tool. We can uh, be at peace with Epicurus. And you might say, wait a second, isn't Seneca a Stoic philosopher? Why is he lauding you know, skeptics and Epicureans? Well, because he thinks that this is part of our inheritance, no matter what, and that Epicurus actually has good things to say. We can, uh, over, we can uh, overcome human nature with the Stoics, the school that Seneca himself belongs to, we can go beyond it with the cynics, which is you know, a, a common theme in cynic philosophy, to go beyond what the average person is capable of doing. All of these are available to us as ways of life and not just as you know, a list of what we ought to do, but theories that we can find in particular texts. He also mentions Pythagoras. He mentions Zeno, of course, the founder of Stoicism. A little bit later, he says, um, we, we uh, can talk about Zeno, Pythagoras, Democritus. So Pythagoras and Democritus are pre-Socratic philosophers. He talks about Aristotle and Theophrastus, Aristotle's close friend and successor. And what do we get from these people? Well, they can be our teachers. They can also be as he says, high priests, that might not be that attractive to us unless we're, you know, sort of religiously oriented, but we could think of them as like, you know, the ones who are the master practitioners, the ones who are keeping this stuff alive. He mentions them being friends with us, which is a very interesting term. He tells us, um, you know, that, that uh, we can have uh, conversation with these. We have friends who advi whose advice we can seek on the greatest or least important matters, who we can consult daily about ourselves, who we can hear the truth without insult and receive praise without fawning, and provide a model after which to fashion ourselves, right? Um, he tells us that they can be our companions, right? Uh, and they can even be our patrons. In, in Roman society, the patron-client relationship was quite important. We can associate ourselves with them. And this leads to another really interesting uh, idea that we're going to talk about in a minute. But before that, let's see some of the other things he says. He tells us none of them will be unavailable to us. So unlike going to you know, somebody's house and like knocking on the door, can so-and-so come out? I want to have a conversation. And they're like, ah, I'm too busy, you know, or they're sick or something like that. If we want to know what Plato has to say, we can read Plato anytime we want to. I mean, you might say, well, 
You can't do it while you're sleeping. Yeah, obviously, right? But you can wake up and then read some Plato. It's up to you what you do with that. If you want to read Seneca, we've got Seneca available. If you want to read uh, Carneades, that's a little bit trickier. We'll talk about the problem of lost texts in just a minute, but we can certainly find out about Carneades in Seneca and in people like Cicero, right? So we have these things available. None of them, he says, will let you leave empty handed, provided you're actually not just going in there and, and uh, treating them as if they're merely your servants or something, but somebody who can tell us about life, about thinking, about human nature. You'll come away, maybe not totally understanding everything, but you're going to gain something in the process. And he has a whole bunch of things where he says, none of them will do X, they will all do Y. So, you know, he says, none of these philosophers will force you to die. How are they going to force you to die? But they will all teach you how to die, how to live your life in such a way that your death won't be a terrible tragedy. None of them will diminish your years. Each will share his own years with you. This is where we get to this. How do we get more life? How do we get more time? How do we get more years? Well, these people share it with us, even though they are dead by our act of reading and conversing with them. Uh, with none of them will conversation be dangerous, friendship life-threatening, or cultivation of them expensive. It's, in some respects, the least expensive thing that you can do, sitting quietly by yourself, reading Plato or Aristotle. And if you think about our own age that we live in, where all of these ancient texts are available for us on the internet for free, it's just amazing. We don't even have to go to the library. We don't have to purchase something. We can read Aristotle online if we want to and commune with him in that way. Now, there are some things, as he says, that are up to us. These are our responsibility. And he says that you take literally what you wish or what you will, right? So you can take whatever it is that you want from us. And different people are going to take different things, perhaps at different ages of life. If I think about my own experience over the last more than 30 years studying and then teaching philosophy, there are certainly some thinkers that I came to appreciate and draw upon later than other thinkers, including Seneca himself. He also talks about becoming part of their households. This is a very interesting idea. He has a contrast here. There's a common saying, it was not in our power to choose the parents we were allotted. They were given to us by chance. But we can be born, he says, to whomever we wish. Now, how is that possible? He says, there are households of the most distinguished intellects. Choose the one into which you'd like to be adopted. And you'll inherit not just the name, but the actual property, which is not to be hoarded in a miserly or mean spirit. The more people you share it with, the greater it will become. For Seneca, this is primarily the Stoic school. So Zeno and Chrysippus and all these other great thinkers, right? Some of whom he, he mentions in his works and in his letters. Um, but he's also willing to become affiliated or adopted by some of these other schools as well. And this is a possibility for us. We don't choose our birth parents. Uh, we may not even choose our adoptive parents, for example, in my case. I was very fortunate in who I got. But we can have ourselves be adopted into whatever philosophical household we find most attractive. Um, now, he goes on and talks about this, coming back to the metaphysics of it, as something that opens the path to immortality. He says, this, meaning studying philosophy, is the sole means of prolonging, stretching out, uh, extending mortality, or rather of transforming it, turning it into immortality. Um, now, what does that mean? We're not going to die? No, we're going to die physically, 
but we can live many, many lifetimes in this life by participating in wisdom. And we might even contribute to it ourselves. Seneca is a prime example, right? We're reading what he had to say about this millennia ago and drawing upon that very wisdom, reenacting it, reawakening it right now as we read and think about what it is that he's saying. So he tells us, you know, honors, monuments, all these sorts of things, these are soon destroyed. There's nothing that the long lapse of time doesn't demolish and transform, but it cannot harm the works consecrated by wisdom. No age will efface them. No age reduce them at all. The next age and each one after that will only enhance the respect in which they're held. Envy focuses on what's close at hand. We more freely admire things from a distance. So the sage's life, the wise person's life is wide in scope and they're not constrained by the same limitations that constrain the rest of us. He says, he alone is released from the limitations of the human race. He is master of ages like a God or God. Um, now, interestingly, this master of ages. It's actually that the ages serve, serviunt in Latin, the wise person. They are all resources available there for him by or her studying the great minds of the past who remain living in that past available for us as all of these different functions. There is something that we should bring up. Namely that, you know, Seneca is referencing all sorts of people that we don't actually have the works of anymore. You know, Pythagoras, we just have some fragments and testimonies. Same with Democritus. Aristotle, we know that we're missing a significant number of his works. We don't have any of Zeno, the founder of Stoicism's works. We don't have Carneades. We have just a minuscule amount of the Epicureans. And interestingly enough, of the Stoics, Seneca is the one who we have the most of. Right? And he's the late Stoic. So what is, does this do anything to his contention? You might say, um, not really, in part because we still do have a lot of Aristotle. We do have access, even though we don't have their texts, to testimonies of the early cynics. And we do have some things by late cynics as well. We do have some things by Epicurus and we have things by other Epicureans and discussions. This conversation, even though texts are lost, we can still participate in it, right? Maybe parts of the household have been locked away until we find those texts. But we also have a vast variety of other thinkers, other texts, other traditions that were not available at the time of Seneca, which includes his own works in these lists, but also all the later philosophies, all the other modes of wisdom that we can participate in in this way. So I think his, his point still holds if we follow him in thinking that we gain access to more life by reading, studying, and conversing with the great thinkers of the past.